Cool. All right. All right. We are recording. It is Wednesday, June 26, 2024. Welcome to the Boulder Arts Commission meeting. I will call the roll. Our technology gets better and different every month. Ryan, <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to make it good for you. Um, Cheryl Cardoso. Here yet? Uh, Yaled Wild. Here. Georgia Schmidt. Here. Caroline Kirk. Here. Jeffrey Cash. Present. Maria Cole. Not here yet. Jill Katzenberger. Here. All right. So I did get yes RSVPs from Cheryl and Ryan, so I'm actually running late. Great. Um, we'll call to order the the June 26, 2024 meeting of the Arts Commission with it. <laughs> um, I'll start with the land acknowledgement and then we'll turn it back over to you. The city of Boulder acknowledges the city is on the ancestral homelands and unceded territory of indigenous peoples who have traversed, lived in, and stored lands in the Boulder Valley since time immemorial. Those indigenous nations include the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Comanche, Pawnee, Shoshone, Sioux, and Ute. The city of Boulder recognizes that those now living and working on these ancestral lands have a responsibility to acknowledge and address the past and must work to build a more just future. All right. You want to? Yes. So we will be going over the public participation guidelines um, to the visual production. Thank you. I'm just going to read these as they're written. Good. The city has engaged with community members to co create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports the physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and council, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, you can visit the website listed on the screen. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. They will be upheld during the meetings. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak in advance and use the name they are commonly known by. Individuals must display their full name before being allowed to speak online. In-person participants are asked to refrain from expressing support or disagreement verbally or with applause. Traditionally, support is shown silently through American Sign Language applause signal, which is taking your hands as such. Uh, that is it for our public participation guide. Thank you. All right. Um, our first order of business is to approve the agenda for today. We can get a motion. I got the motion to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Okay, that carries. And approval of the May 24 meeting minutes. I have one question about that. Okay. Um, it said that in the, I may, um, forgive me if I'm reading it incorrectly. It said the people in attendance that didn't seem correct. Where are you looking? Here. Members present and then the guests present. Yeah, the public. I didn't see all those people. Were they on the line? Yeah, they're online. Okay. Any I, other? I have one edit as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the uh, liaison report, mine on the Boulder Phil, it said that I had reported that the season was over, which sounds rather fat, finite. And what I had actually reported was that the successful uh, uh, season had conducted. Great. Thanks. You can take the pun as it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other edits? Okay. Um, with those edits in mind, we get a motion. Oh, I'll make a motion. Second. 
Okay, all in favor? I'm abstaining because I wasn't great. Thank you. Public participation. Do we have anybody signed up to speak? Yeah. Um, so first we have Mr. Colleen Benson. Yeah, you can uh, come up and speak. Um, I think it's easy to be standing near the the, the bean. <laughs> 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 well, hi, uh, my name is Colleen Hudson. Um, I have a little something. Um, I'm here uh, representing the Catamounts, um, and I am their new education director, um, which through the support of the commission, um, Amanda Berg Wilson, the artistic director, was able to bring me in to help manage some of the educational programming that um, we're kind of kicking back into gear. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we are uh, hoping and uh, we're going to be serving our educational programming in a couple of schools in Boulder this year, again with the support of the commission. Um, both at Heatherwood and Douglas Elementary, we do a seven week program, um, uh, theater residency, um, interdisciplinary arts residency. Um, and so um, just wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, the support of the Boulder Arts uh, Commission has allowed the Catamounts to grow tremendously in the past several years, um, even throughout the disruption with the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Most recently, we offered Camp Catamounts for the first time since the pandemic, so it's actually before the pandemic, um, which is a week-long camp in which campers created their own production um, using theater, dance, and music. Um, and we, this year, we were able to incorporate a cooking component to it, modeling it after the Catamounts feed series. Um, and with your support, um, we've been able to create a uniquely Colorado company incorporating space, small business, and stories that are unique to Colorado in our work. And if you have any questions about the Catamounts educational programming, I would be happy to meet with you at any time. Thank you. <laughs> Where did you Thanks come for from? being here. Yeah. Uh, originally, I am from Florida, most recently from Omaha, Nebraska, where I worked as a teaching artist um, for about seven years with a large children's theater out there. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome to Boulder. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, so, second, we have Alyssa Hoffman and Becca. In line with city council practice, Melissa Foxman has requested to four minutes with Brandy Lubendahl and Jennifer Mendelson for a total of six minutes for her public participation. Okay, and uh, just for the record, are those both here right now? Great, and we are agreeing to that. And then... oh, Brandy's online. Brandy is online. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So, well, do you want to have any sort of warning one minute warning or anything like I, that i try i think it fits okay kind of, so. <laughs> all right thank you okay mm -hmm. um so i'm melissa fathman executive director of the Larry arts center and i'm not here before you to focus on the rubric scoring um an appeal has already been submitted at the request of the creative nations leadership council i'm also not here to correct the record with regard to a reckless statement made during the last meeting implying misappropriation of funds that will be addressed by one of our board members um, later on tonight. I stand before you and our entire community today because we are at an important juncture in the evolution of Boulder's arts community. I'm sharing my story because many of us in positions of power and leadership do recognize that we are working within a system that is inherently unfair and inaccessible to many members of our community. I am here to speak to you from my heart about how, why, and when Creative Nations was started, and to hopefully inspire others to continue leaning in and finding ways to continue the work of restoring balance. Before it had a name, the concept for Creative Nations was an idea that came to me over five years ago during a mural dedication ceremony, a mural created to raise awareness for missing and murdered indigenous women during the smudging ceremony, Sarah Ortigan, member of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho, looked up at the Flatirons from our parking lot and said, this is where my family used to live. I instantly felt extreme sadness deep within my heart and thought if I could give the land back, I would. 
The more I thought about it, I realized I could approximate a land back scenario. Is it a perfect example of land back? No, it is not. The city of Boulder owns the building and the land. So I'm not personally able to give the land back, but what I can do as the executive director of the Dairy Arts Center with the support of the Dairy Board is to make a decision to permanently dedicate a portion of our building to be used by indigenous creatives, handing over to them full creative control of their programming. I began by first reaching out to Tanea Winder, author, singer, songwriter, poet, and enrolled member of the Duckwater Shoshone Nation. Prior to the pandemic, the dairy had already established a partnership with Tanea and CU's Upward Bound program to offer arts experiences at the dairy to visiting indigenous high school students. After hearing my idea, she introduced me to a book by Edgar Villanueva that formed a lot of my early thinking about the concept. The book is called Decolonizing Wealth, Indigenous Wisdom to Heal Divides and Restore Balance, a book I highly recommend you all read. It outlines seven steps that culminate in using resources of money and access as medicine to heal and repair the past hurts and current unfair and unbalanced structures. Tanea then assembled a group of indigenous artists for our first conversation in December, 2020. Many of them then became the founders of what they later established as creative nations. The dairy then raised over $200,000 to renovate the corner of our building to establish the creative nation's sacred space plus promised to allocate $40,000 annually from our general operating fund to help pay for program costs. During one of our meetings in the early years, there was talk of forming their own 501c3, but it was determined that they needed more time and support to build capacity before they felt prepared to strike out on their own. It has been three and a half years full of powerful exhibitions, native comedy showcases, arts markets, concerts, dance performances, poetry and play readings. In addition to money and space, we also shared our administrative experience and skills with regard to production, grant writing, and finance. This program has recently become a model for other organizations across the country to establish similar types of opportunities for indigenous artists, such as Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, Center Theater in Los Angeles, and the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. But for me, the most poignant outcome is what, what we gained as people. In the process of working so closely together, we listened, learned, and laughed with one another, gaining wisdom and forming deep and lasting friendships. I stand before you to tell you all of this because it was extremely disheartening to all of us to listen to a conversation about our organization and our relationship with the creative nations that clearly indicated a misguided perspective formed from the outside with no attempt to get to know us and our collective intentions with regard to creative nations. We are living in dangerous times in which the truth does not seem to matter anymore. Let us not get pulled into those urges. Our community is made up of artists and creatives with the capacity to envision and create what others cannot see or imagine yet, and what does not yet exist. We can and will continue to make change. I invite you all to join us in our continuing collective work for becoming a model of mutual respect and glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, appreciate you taking the time. I'm, um, I'm sorry that uh, personal conversations um, are having to be had through this medium. Um, do you have, if in the future, we as commissioners have the types of questions you've heard coming up, um, as long as we're not in a blackout period or in grant scoring, is there any particular way that you would encourage us to reach out to the dairy or I think I think for anyone, frankly, um, you know, when when people are talking about an organization and a question comes up and they don't really know the answer and it's sort of, well, I think it's this, I think it's that, you know, I maybe the the conversation can be closed momentarily until someone finds out the answer. I think that would help 
you know, his decisions, I see decisions then getting made without without those questions being fully addressed. So I don't logistically know how it would work, but I think that would help the entire grant process. Thank you. And since I do know that you're talking about me, I'll let you know that I did actually speak with both leaders of Creative Nations, the man that was there during the murdered and missing indigenous women project who was employed at the time. I spoke with him on several occasions and I did speak with the woman, young woman that was there last fall. So. Up next, we have Austin and Tavet. Okay. Hey. Maybe let me know if there's 15 seconds left. 15 seconds? Okay, I'll give you a 15 so I can wrap second. It up. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. Hello. My name is Osman Parvez. I've been a resident in Boulder since 2005, and I have a business in Boulder, and I've been on the board of the dairy since 2000, uh, 2021. And I grew up in upstate New York, where I definitely experienced racism of all kinds and things that hurt very deeply in my life. And I can share with you that as a board member of the dairy, there is no way at all I would participate for the last few years if I had ever seen any sort of racist expression or intent of racism within the community that I've been serving at the dairy. So I came here to share that of my own personal lived experience as a board member of the dairy and as a person of color and someone who has experienced racism very personally. And I know what that feels like, and I know what it looks like. And if I had seen it even once at the dairy, I would not be serving on this board. And that's all I wanted to share with this group. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Uh, last Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gaia Binet, and I stand before you as a board member and as a secretary of the Dairy Yard Center. And I wanted to voice my unwavering support for the dairy. As we know, the dairy has been the cornerstone of creativity and cultural enrichment since its transformation since in 1992. Um, the dairy provides diverse opportunities to engage in high quality performances, cinematic and visual arts experiences. If you haven't been, please come and please enjoy all the wonderful things that the dairy has to offer. Recent claims regarding the exclusion of indigenous voices and fund mismanagement by the Dairy Arts Center are completely false. The dairy has always been committed to inclusivity, supporting indigenous voices and through initiatives like Creative Nations, which provides a platform for indigenous artists. Allegations that the dairy has somehow misused Creative Nations grant money are completely unfounded. The dairy maintains rigorous accounting practices and transparency, detailed reporting on grants received, and their very specific uses can be provided. We have records showing active communication and collaboration with Creative Nations concerning grants. The Dairy Arts Center meets the financial and organizational requirements necessary for being a 501c3 entity, demonstrating competence in managing and dispersing funds appropriately. We've just been through a major audit. If you've been through an audit, you know you don't get a clean certificate without having all your finances in order. So any assertions questioning their credibility are completely baseless. Plans for Creative Nations to operate independently have been in progress for some time, supported by the dairy, reflecting our commitment to fostering community growth. Comments questioning Marty, who is the managing director of Creative Nations, any comments questioning his ability to lead Creative Nations are both insulting and inaccurate. Marty has demonstrated strong leadership and resilience. And if you haven't met him, I believe he was here doing it, came and presented, but if any chance to meet him personally is welcome. The Dairy Art Center remains dedicated to transparency, inclusivity, and responsible management of resources, ensuring that every single voice is heard and valued. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Polar Arts. Are you connected to the internet? Yes. Is it is taking someone here? Is there anybody else? No, we're having 
Great. Just a moment. Uh, thank you to everybody who came from the dairy and for your service on the board of directors. And I just wanted to um, open the floor if anybody had any direct questions about what was specifically what was stated here. I was a little confused about your comments about if there were some allegations of misuse of funds. I don't recall that being part of any conversation. Or, or that Marty was not capable of leading Creative Nations. I don't remember. Um, you can answer, go ahead. Uh, if you would come back up to the front of the room. Um, I am paraphrasing here because I don't have the transcript in front of me. So that was to address um, two points. One was, in response to a comment that you made again, I'm paraphrasing, which said that the way the way the dairy sort of functions in these grants is that they give a little bit of money to the organization and the rest is to keep the lights on. Um, and I think you said to keep the lights on, which is not accurate and that's not how a grant process works. I mean, right, you know, and I know that you submit for a grant and every single dollar has to be accounted for. So we're not doing some sort of a 60-40 split where we're taking money from you and giving it to salary and things like that. There are specific grants for that. Um, and the second was, I think somebody brought up in the last meeting, and I don't remember who's saying that you met with Marty, he came by, he gave this very impassioned speech about the Creative Nations. And um, and I think, once again, I'm paraphrasing, and you said, well, it seems like, well, this is the, the classic sort of definition of systemic racism where, you know, um, somebody of color comes by and is being used as sort of a puppet to, to speak on behalf of an organization and is somehow being manipulated. And again, I'm paraphrasing, so it may not be accurate. We may have to go back to the transcript, transcript to pull what exactly you said. So that's what I'm referring to. Here. Okay, I would definitely recommend that you go back because- Well, I, I have I in no it, way- so I am no well, we way. Can pull up the transcript. I'm sure that's sure enough. Do that. Yeah. Because I am I don't know Marty well enough to say to decide whether he's capable of doing anything. And I would never say that to someone. I'm sure there's a transcript that we can review. So let's, we can look let's at that. leave that conversation Thank there. Um, Thank you. Carolyn, I'd, yeah. I'd like to accept the invitation of Melissa and others to go over and learn more and meet with them. Yeah. Do we do that as a, a group or as individuals, or what's the right? What's the next step? Well, if it's going to be more than just a couple of us, it would need to be as a scheduled open meeting. So, um, so what's the what's the best way? To what would forward? you recommend? This stuff. Mm, well, <laughs> I mean, no, it's okay. I'm just thinking when it is an open scheduled meeting, we have to have minutes and things, and an agenda that's published. It's kind of a formal process to have a group of you together. Um, so I would recommend maybe groups of two. I don't know how much time. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's kind of yeah, like, here, could you take eight groups around? Sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, these are the recommendations. Lauren, can I ask where the microphone is this month? It is. It's in the owl. <laughs> it's in the owl. Oh, it's in the owl. OK, thank you. It's in the owl. Thank you. Look at the technology. I only ask that because we've got a lot of lot more eyes on the last couple of meetings. And I yes. want to make sure that everyone's being heard and yes. knowing where and how to speak. Thank you. I'd be interested in going with you if you'd like, and and if other people are interested, maybe we can pair up and reach out. Yes. I'm interested as well. I'm kind of interested. Yeah. See a lot of nods. I'm there yes. a lot. Yeah, I figure you probably. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah, sure. Great. So I can help connect you two if you need or connect you to each other. You can't email each other about scheduling things. Just Yeah. Yeah. And if anyone wants Marty's cell number, I have that. So you can mm -hmm. actually coordinate with him so he could actually give you a personalized tour. Great. Um, I'm happy to do that through Melissa. Yes. Then, right? Yeah. Well, Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Commission business. Uh, land acknowledgement updates. Oh, just very quickly. So I've been speaking with my colleague, um, Phil, who's one of the primary contacts for the um, tribal council. He's wonderful and excellent and has a really, really um, 
deep, thoughtful history about working with tribal council in the city of Boulder, is kind of a longer history. Um, so he and I are talking ongoing about what it means to do an update. So thank you, Caroline and Georgia and Maria for like kind of hanging in there while I'm talking to him about everything, because it does seem like it might be a bigger city discussion. It might, It is certainly a bigger discussion with him and tribal council and other members of staff, um, not just about the land acknowledgement, but just to help us all learn about the history of um, indigenous peoples in this area and what that means to be an arts commissioner in relation to like the sort of relations that we have with tribal council. So thank you all for your patience. I'm working on it, but I will give any updates as soon as we have them for Great. timing for meeting all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. And then um I do know that we're working on the interim plan for the cultural plan. Did you have an update? Oh sure. So we hope to in the next couple of months um start building out our year-long um, cultural planning, but we're going to be calling it a blueprint, the Boulder blueprint for the next 19, 20 years. So I look forward to working with all of you on it very intimately. Please and thank you. And everybody in the audience and everybody listening now or later, um, as soon as we have any, thank you for asking, as soon as we have any information, I'm, I'm, I will be sharing with you because I expect to have everybody in this room help us out. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Any other commission business? All right, uh, liaison updates and other topics from the community. Do any of the commissioners have liaison updates or anything fun that you saw going on in the community? Well, we usually have so many. I, I, was, gonna, <laughs> I was gonna defer to you because you always start the- I would get excited. Yeah. I guess, likewise. <laughs> uh, I can't remember if I updated this last time, but BMOCA has a fantastic show now. If you all have not seen that, go see that. Um, one of their artists did a talk the other night, I can't remember which night, sorry. And I guess there was 126 folks that attended. So great attendance and a lot of excitement around that show. Um, the uh, movement towards the North Boulder campus is still ongoing. And uh, uh, considering a lot of, uh, I think there's 60 architects, so a lot of architect submissions. So that's gonna be fantastic. And something I forgot to mention that happened not this month, but the previous month, I went to a concert with uh, Youth Orchestra, it was a house concert, which mm. all of you, if you get a chance to go to a house concert, it's fantastic. So Youth Orchestra, Boulder Youth Orchestra and Boulder Phil, and there are some really talented young people in this community and Boulder Phil as well had a visiting artist and um, just the, the synergy between a visiting artist and a young emerging um, artist was fantastic. I think we're gonna mm. see this young artist go places. So great, great things going on. I went to an event at the Dairy, which is classic films brought to us by a gentleman called Jeff Katz, Cash. <laughs> and it is, um, if you don't have a, haven't had a chance to go to that series yet, it's so fun. It's like um, the research and commentary that you add to it just really Make I thought the people experience. were going to hurt themselves laughing. It was we, the, it was the, the producer. producer. The original 1967. Um, and getting to see it on the big screen and getting to have that sort of historical context on the production side is so much fun. <laughs> so I highly recommend that. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> how about you two? And I'll, okay. Uh, friendly reminder to everyone, the Shakespeare Festival is up and running. They have uh, the, the Scottish play playing right now. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, they have another show opening in July. They are all indoors as the Mary, Rip Mary Ripon Theater is being renovated as part of the renovation to the 1921 building that surrounds it, uh, both this year and next year. Um, and when we went to get tickets several weeks in advance, there were very few left for the performances we were looking. So if you do plan to go, please uh, get on that list and, and get those now. Also, uh, Colorado Music Festival, not sure who their liaison is. I'm, I've become very involved with them. <laughs> for who? Colorado Music Festival, as you talk about. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember who their liaison is. I don't think I'll it's because I'm Boulder Phil. I will look, but also we are reassigning next month. So. Okay, great. Anyway, they've got their season uh, uh, coming up at Chautauqua. If you've not experienced it, please do that. Uh, went to Movers and Shakers at the Dairy this past week. 
uh, which is one of their new fundraisers that's been reinvigorated since the pandemic. And they were back to 2017 numbers with the attendance. It's great to see so many community leaders and a lot of arts leaders there, as well as uh, a lot of folks from their various committees and board members. Uh, Modus Theater has a full summer schedule, unlike a lot of theater companies that aren't summer specific events. Um, make sure you check out their um, programming that they're doing. During the classic film series, I got to visit the NAACP, which is doing their Juneteenth event at the dairy also, and got to see uh, some, some lovely friends there that are involved with that. So it was uh, a busy few weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is kind of old because I wasn't here last month, but I went to Betsy's Mad Librarians mm -hmm. improv show, and it was my child's first improv show, and I love improv, and I was very happy that she also loved it, and she's like, let's go again, let's go again, and so we will look to see. I'm not sure what the rest of their summer schedule is, but I do recommend it for all ages. It was really fun. Love it. And Betsy yeah. does have their following season already published out there, and they're, they've got a really exciting season ahead. Yeah. Um, I saw Perlando's The Lightning Thief, it's a Percy Jackson musical. Um, mm -hmm. It was great. It was so good. Um, and then the that was also at the dairy. Um, the Spark has a summer concert opening this Friday. And I think the last day is July 7th. I think they're doing Les Mis songs. So Ooh, yeah, it's going to be really good. Is that Boulder Opera that's doing that there? Or is it something that they're doing specifically? It's something they're doing specifically. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then junkyard, I'll defer to you. I was going to say, I promise I will get out of my own space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a ton happening right now with kind of the, the heat of the summer. But uh, Saturday, we're hosting Rock About Equities big fundraiser, Queer Circus. It's one of my favorite events of the year. Um, Let's see what else is coming up. We just had the Boulder Comedy Festival, sold out night of the Boulder Comedy Festival last week. Um, Queer Comedy Festival is coming up at the end of this summer, but already starting to help them review some of their applications for that. Um, yeah, I'll come with a more prepared list next time. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll, you'll be assigned. <laughs> yeah. assigned yeah. organizations. I bet Bruce was... Colorado Music Festival. Oh, I think that's oh, how that right. that makes sense. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. That makes okay. Sense. Cool. Anybody else? Okay. Moving on to the public art program. Am I sitting over here so they can sit down there together? Sorry. While oh, you're eating, I like that. Nice and casual. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's been a Hi, while Brandon. since we've got an update from public art. So we're excited to share a few uh, fun and interesting things. And then Rachel and I will kind of walk you through a progress report for our collection audit project. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. Brendan Picker Mahoney, uh, public art program manager. Hi, I'm Rachel Kane with More Sky, Less Ceiling, doing your public art. Public art. Audit. 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 Yay. <laughs> we had great right. discussions about that last month. Yeah. 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 We have an update for you. Yay. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk about three um, calls for art that are open right now for the Western City Campus. Uh, we have a dedication event at the new Novo Library on Saturday morning. Uh, installation planning is happening for the North Broadway Public Art Project. And then we also have some downtown public art tours. So um, our three RFQs are open until Friday, this Friday, June 28th at 11.59 p.m. We have one call uh, for Colorado artists. It's a 2D call uh, for work in the stairwell and elevator lobby. That's a $100,000 budget. We have an international call for outdoor sculptures for the plaza of the Western City Campus building, and that budget is $300,000. And we have an international call for two suspended artworks for the lobby and the atrium. The atrium is in the parking garage, and the lobby is at the Western City Campus building, and that budget is four hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. So those calls again, they close in two days. Um, but I think you all received an email from Lauren. The art selection panel has been sh was shared with them a month ago. Um, so we're really excited. We're getting some good turnout for those calls. And are those listed through Cafe? They are. They're on okay. callfurniture.org. They're also linked from our website. Okay. Our website. 
and the monthly emails that are coming from the the newsletter has been mentioning them. Correct. Yep. And they're on social media. So follow us on Instagram. <laughs> All right. So we have a dedication event this Saturday. Uh, the artwork is called Nuages by Daily uh, Tulajor at the New Novo Library. The event starts, the event opens at 10 a.m., but the actual dedication ceremony begins at 11 a.m. Um, so it's a, it's a public opening. It's a grand opening for the library and the artwork um, it's an interactive musical work um, as you walk up the ramp to the upper entrance to the library. So come check out this amazing artwork, meet the artists, um, and see the new library. We are uh, planning for installation for the North Broadway Public Art Project. The artist's name is Sharon Dowell. Um, she's working with a local fabricator in Denver. Um, they will also be installing the artwork. Um, we're getting our permits ready. Um, and planning the installation for August. It includes two bus shelters in, in North Boulder along North Broadway, um, and also uh, the railings across the kind of underpass um, right near Violet Park, right near the Novo Library, and then also another little um, kind of gateway project as you enter the North Broadway Art District. And then finally, thanks to all of Jake's help, we have guided public art tours that uh, actually started uh, this past Saturday. There's actually a tour happening right now as we speak. They're probably just getting to the end of uh, Pearl Street Mall or maybe into Civic area. Uh, we have two amazing docents leading public art tours. Um, right now they're scheduled on Saturdays at 11 and Wednesdays at 5.30. We might alter those, those start times. Um, we might actually split the tour. We're getting some feedback and we're just kind of adjusting as we need to go. So to make sure that it's enjoyable for everybody. Uh, but the tour is about an hour and a half long. You'll see artworks along Pearl Street Mall and in the civic area. And that's the QR code to um, get to our page, public art page. How far Sorry. is the distance? It's about a mile and a half okay. total. Yes. Do you, I'm sorry, I should have looked at the page, but is there um, uh, access, ability to for access for you know, visually impaired or language? If or... somebody needs, um, if somebody needs like a sign language interpreter, we can we can request that. It's not it's not on every tour, but as needed, we can we can try to request that from the city. We're also okay. working on a self guided tour that could be you know that could be listened to with a screen reader type of thing. So that's mm -hmm. in the works. Not really yet. But... Yeah, I would love to see it. Like, Nova, our singers have that proposal for um, mm -hmm. kind of a walking self guided tour mm -hmm. in like one a of the parks. Tour. Yeah. yeah, so mm -hmm. they might have who, who um, is that? Uh, the Novar singers. Oh. Ursa Nova singers. singers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they might at least have technology or have um, a contact for technology to do that. They were doing that from the Park Correct. thing yeah. last summer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Talk to Kim over there. Kim Brody. I'll connect you. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good Thank idea. Thinking. Yeah. And finally, we'll jump into our public art collection audit update. Um, again, we hired Rachel Kane. Let's see, it's been about six months since we've been working on this project. So this was this came out of the um, accessible signage plan. Uh, we have some funds set aside to create new signage for all the artworks. But before we could create signage for all the artworks, we had to figure out exactly which artworks we have in the collection and where they all are and how they got there. Um, so that's what we've been working on. Rachel has been amazing. We also have uh, Rachel Denegi, who's a CU Boulder grad student, um, assisting with some writing and research. Um, and Jake and I, of course, are always there to help out, too. So. I'll let Rachel take it away. And um, we, if you have questions, we'll just wait till the end of the presentation. I think we'll answer most of your questions along the way, um, but feel free at the end to to jump in with any questions about the, the process we're going through. Thanks. Yeah. It's so fun to see new projects because I have had my brain in old projects for so long, for the last six months. And so seeing what's happening is really very exciting. <laughs> um, okay, next slide, please. So we originally started, I started this work with 340 potential objects. So mm -hmm. we thought there was a collection of 340 pieces for the city of Boulder. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> 340. Um, and then we decided to create a criteria for what we were going to include in the audit. So that was basically three different things. It had to be owned by the city of Boulder, which does not mean that it's privately owned. 
or it does not mean that it was created by a nonprofit who just left it on city property. <laughs> um, so it must be owned by the city of Boulder, first and foremost. It has to have minimum data points, which means we need to know who created it. We have to have an artist's name. If we don't know who created it, we can't do any research. We can't look for any documentation. We can't find a contract. So minimum data points, like hopefully this thing has also a title, which would be great, but really artist name is first and foremost. Materials. You know? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> minimum. You can assess that, but that's secondary. And that's why, that's why it's minimum. Like yeah. we can do a lot with a little bit, but we do need something. Um, and then third is physical presence. <clears throat> there are a lot of pieces that are cataloged that I was given information about that actually don't exist anymore or nobody knows where they are or there's any number of reasons why they don't exist anymore. So physical presence is important also because you can't document a piece if it doesn't exist. Thanks. So then here's the breakdown of what was actually included or what I've included in the audit. <clears throat> the library actually owned 206 pieces out of the 340. Yeah, that's a big chunk. Is that because the arts department used to be under the library or is it more connected with the physical library? I oh, think there's uh, Zansky also have an oh. yeah, sure. You may or, or we can hold all the questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Um, we, we might actually answer this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, might, we might, and we also might not, which is why right. I really need time for questions. <laughs> um, okay, so then from to the left there, there are 43 pieces not included because they either didn't have the minimum data points, they weren't physically present, or they weren't owned by the city, which leads us to the third pie there, private. There were 11 pieces out of that 340 that are actually privately owned. Several of them were on the Pearl Street Mall. You might be familiar with them. <laughs> which leaves parks with 41, transportation with 29, and arts and culture with seven. Next. So that's 79 objects owned by the city of Boulder out of 340. So from there, we created criteria for how we're defining public art, because as you noticed in the previous slide, some of these pieces were commissioned or created, acquired from parks for transportation and various other city departments. So how do we define public art versus something like urban design or benches or um, shade structures? So this is the criteria that we decided to use for defining public art. Completion date has a lot to do with when the public art policy was created in 2018. So anything before that is automatically not part of the arts and culture process because it didn't exist yet. Really very simple. Um, provenance has everything to do with can it, can we find evidence about how this thing was created, how it how it came to be, and how it came to be here in this place and assumed to be part of the city's assets. Um, third one, intention has everything to do with again whether the creator decided to call this piece art or they decided to call this piece uh, physical enhancement to a playground or something. So what was the intention of the creator? Is it supposed to be art or is it supposed to be something else? Um, and then again, process has a lot to do with the public art process. Um, public art in my, in my definition of the thing, public art is the process. The art is, yes, you have evidence of the physical thing left in the world, but the art is the process by which that thing was created. And so if there hasn't been a public process by which this thing came to be, it's probably not public art. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then documentation. If, if we can't find any information about things, it's really hard to decide what to do with it. So we're still peeling that apart. Which, which would include contracts with an artist, maintenance plans, um, other provenance information. Yeah. And so it's also, the documentation describes how it came to be and also how the owner intends to maintain it so that it can continue to be an asset for the city. If you can't maintain it, it falls into disrepair, it becomes untenable and it becomes unsafe and it's not no longer an asset for the city, it's a liability. So you need to have the documentation so you can take care of it. And then unique circumstances, like every once in a while something will happen where there's maybe a piece that has none of the rest of that, but is incredibly valuable because of who created it, or it's impossible to move because of where it's sited or it's a piece that was 
created with the intention of not being in existence for more than 10 years. So it doesn't make sense to include it for financial reasons. So unique circumstances are the, the one-off things that we also need to consider, which there are only two. <laughs> so the, the never ending debate between public art versus urban design. Um, the two images on the side are two pieces in Boulder's collection that we- on the left side. Left yes. side, yes. Um, that are public art. The pieces on the right side are what we consider to be urban design. So top left, you have Pilot Navigator. It was created by an artist with the intention of being an art piece in the public place. There was a commissioning process around it and it's freestanding and it's maintained where it is perfectly. It's, it's kinetic and it still moves, which is fantastic. And that one actually entered the donation process. Yes, which exactly. Is still above and there's documentation around it, which is how we know right. that it was adopted. Yeah. And then um, 55 degrees on the bottom left, I assume that everybody understands that process pretty well. Um, the top right is a retaining wall. And then That's bottom- That's 28. Well, that yeah, a lovely way. entrance to the city. Yeah, yeah. So, it's great. Yeah. It's also urban design and not public art. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's connected to a utility for the city. It's also, it serves a purpose for infrastructure, not fundamentally as an art place. So you can have artistic elements integrated into city infrastructure, but again, in terms of the artist's intention, this is a retaining wall. First and foremost, that has an artistic element added to it. It wasn't created to be art first. And then the bottom right is a bus stop. It's a bus, it's a bus shelter. It's, it's interesting as a piece of metal fabrication, but again, the intention was for it to be a bus shelter, not a piece of artwork. So we consider that to be urban design. So just in terms of education around public art and nomenclature as we move forward with this. Um, next, we'll talk about urban design again, but just so that you have that context. Um, so from the Parks and Rec sort of sub collection of 41 pieces, I'm recommending that we adopt 20 sculpture and then one mosaic, etching, watercolor, and one relief. So that's almost half their collection. We're hoping to adopt from them. Are you going to talk about, is it appropriate to talk about why, what criteria goes into that recommendation or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is a visual example of some of the pieces from parks that we're anticipating adopting. <laughs> so you can see there's different sculptures, there's a mosaic, there's a piece that's suspended from the ceiling, different material, different ages. They may or may not be familiar to you as commissioners, but they're out in the world. So and Wait, you considering adopting them? What did you say? Yeah, so let me, let me, can we go back one slide? Yeah. So the city's Parks and Rec department owns 41 artworks. Their, their department is responsible for commissioning, creating, purchasing those pieces that exist in parks right now. So the parks department is well suited to maintain parks and they've been doing the maintenance of art up until now. And now it's time for us as the arts and culture department to take those works from them so that we can make sure that they're maintained properly okay. and we can make sure that they get the signage that you all want them to have so that people can understand that their public dollars went to go pay for those pieces that are in public spaces. And I'll mention and this really is all project. still a work in progress. So these sure. numbers might yeah. change a little bit yeah. and we still have to have conversations with several different city departments to make our offer. But I think it's with... 2A funding coming. This is part of our, our kind of mandate is to really start to care for the art in, in a real way. Um, I think in the past, it's always been that other city departments can look to us for some guidance with maintenance, but in terms of like actually caring for these artworks, um, this is our goal is to say, hey, this is a formal, uh, we're offering to formally adopt these, make this a judicial, make this a, a real city decision so that it's clear to everybody who's responsible for what. And I'm assuming we're going to get to a reserve study so that we know how much to have set aside for future care of existing. That's actually probably part of our blueprint. Yeah. And Perfect. Yeah. For sure. So, but all the artworks you saw on the previous slide, those are parks, you know, owned by Parks and Recreation, but they kind of met our criteria for public art. There's an artist name attached mm -hmm. to it, there's a title, there's some sort of there's some data points in terms of like documentation, how the piece got to be there. Um, and as you can see, they're kind of, they, they are artworks that can live 
on their own as it works and not as urban design or some sort of other enhancement or decorative purpose. Great. Right. Yeah. Spend a lot of time on that blog. <laughs> yeah, it's a really popular. We want to yeah. take care of it. That's yeah. our public art tour. So yeah. that's what I was like, wait, country. you're doing what with it? <laughs> I'm keeping them. That's what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. I'm taking good care. And here's a graphic representation of what we're hoping to adopt from transportation. So 10 sculptures and then four pieces of urban design. And again, as Brendan said, it's a work in progress. This is not like a set in stone, definitely going to happen kind of thing. But here's three examples of it's where we're headed. We're, yeah. yeah, we're hoping to adopt from transportation. And these are three examples of, of sculptural works that we can find an artist, we can find a title, we can find some documentation that we think makes it an actual public artwork um, and which we could maintain in the city. So when we anticipate the makeup of these of our collection for Boulder, when this is all said and done, this is what it might look like. So mostly sculpture, and then we have a couple of other things, different materials, but by and large, lots of sculpture, which is great. Yeah. I'll hold my question, sorry. <laughs> We're almost, almost done. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to take the next slide? I'll take next okay. steps, yeah. Okay, so next steps, as Brendan said, uh, conversations with Parks and Rec, Health and Human Services, and Transportation. These are the departments that have, like I said, commissioned, acquired, or otherwise purchased art that's owned by the city. They may or may not be maintaining these pieces. They may or may not have the budget to do that. They may or may not necessarily know specifically how to do that. So there's a lot of conversations around, around that whole question. Um, physical inventory is also part of it too. As I mentioned, physical presence is a requirement for adoption. So if these pieces can't be found, they can't be adopted, which means physical inventory is an ongoing sort of rinse and repeat kind of thing. Um, and then after that, we'll do updates to the Beehive database and then import the collection to the public art archive. Those are more database nerdy zone that I love. <laughs> um, but the beta, the Beehive database is a database that um, Brendan will use to manage the assets of the city. Um, and all the information that we're collecting will live in the Beehive database and will be accessible to different departments so that people can understand what works are in what place. And all the information that we're collecting can be available to the people in the city. And then the Public Art Archive is an online national database of public artworks from hundreds of collections that I may or may not have started a long time ago. <laughs> and then Brendan got the last two points. Yeah, uh, and I'll just mention that the Beehive database is actually a citywide asset management tool. So all city departments use it for light posts, parking meters, you name it, it's in that database. So we wanna make sure that our public artworks are in the database and updated and all the fields are filled. Um, so then the next steps, you know, after we kind of populate the Beehive and Public Art Archive is to go back to our accessible signage plan, implement that plan, take the 40 something artworks, um, make sure that our signage is consistent. And then uh, back to your point, Jeffrey, to make a maintenance plan for the collection and really visit each work and assess what the needs are for those pieces and then start to put people to work to make any repairs. So yeah, now we're open for questions. I have questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first question, help me understand. Um, so Parks and Recreation, for example, there's a subset that you are recommending that we take over. Are the remainder that are staying with them, those are, are things that you wouldn't necessarily define as public art? Is that Correct. the so difference? Some good examples of those would be, again, on Pearl Street Mall. Um, there's a couple, like there's the a huge granite rock that's split in half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Parks and Rec considers that public art. We don't. Okay. It, there's no artist name attached to it. There's no title. Okay. From what we can tell, there's no records, zero records on that piece. But from what we can tell is that Parks went to the quarry, split a rock, installed it, and kind of made like a placemaking mm -hmm. element along the Pearl Street Mall, which is great. And we think it's fabulous that it's there and people really enjoy it but we don't consider that public art and that's not something that we would want to maintain 
and it probably doesn't need maintenance either. Like, <laughs> right? So if you can adopt it as a collection, and then how are you going to describe it to people? And there's no need yeah. to maintain it. So why go through all of that? Yeah, yeah. so just love it. George Karakian probably knows the exact history of it. And why it's there. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you probably put it there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some examples of works that we would say, hey, Parks and Rec, these are, these are works that you bought or commissioned or placed. And if you need help, with some maintenance. If you have maintenance questions, if you need referrals, if you need some guidance on maintenance of other works, we're happy to help with that. But in terms of making a, a formal, you know, discrete public art collection that is maintained by our office, this is that's this is the path we're we're okay. heading. And can I just add one yeah. more thing too? And likewise, as an example from transportation, there are several tile murals around town that were created by school children zero documentation, and those pieces were never intended to be permanent, right? There's mm -hmm. not really anything you can do to maintain them to extend the life of those pieces. They're going to be chipped, the paint's going to peel, there's not really anything you can do about it. So my recommendation is to have transportation keep those pieces, maintain them as they are as part of the infrastructure that they're attached to, and not adopt them, because there's not really a way that you can maintain them, and you don't have any idea who created them, so you can't Recreate them to actually repair the piece. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Um, is there any anticipation of contentiousness, like with going to parks and rec or transportation? Like, do they want us? <laughs> do they want us to have it? Do they not want us to have? It? Bring your profile. We <laughs> had preliminary conversations with transportation and parks. Transportation is kind of understands where we're coming from. I think, and I think that they appreciate that we want to really help with maintenance. Uh, they also understand that a lot of their their works are, are not public art and that they wouldn't expect us to maintain a lot of the infrastructure that has enhancements on it. Parks and Rec, I think there's much less documentation in Parks and Rec. Transportation, at least there's some documentation that we can look at that will help inform our conversation, whereas Parks and Rec, it's, there's a lot of missing. So I think the conversation is going to be a little bit more gray in terms of who is best responsible for caring for some of these artworks. But I don't think it's going to be contentious. I think it's we're 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 making an offer, and then you know, chat to be a ball. I don't think so. I think it's about education, honestly. Like yeah. when when yeah. we talk to them about how it's going to benefit their department to have a different department maintain the works that they're spending hopefully that they're spending their budget to do. Yeah. I don't know why they would say no to us adopting them. I yeah. think as it stands right now, they're, they don't know what it means. And so the conversation is really starts from a place of education. Yeah. yeah I was that, that's like citywide. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask how many of these departments would you go to and say, hi, we're taking an inventory of art and this is your art that you are currently maintaining and how, how many of them were surprised going, oh, really? This, we're responsible for this. We're still <laughs> early in those conversations. Right, yeah, yeah, I'll give it that <laughs> There'll be another update. And then, yeah. of course, just kind of as a recap of what we uh, discussed with the uh, uh, the gals who uh, kind of put together uh, kind of the gap year stuff we were talking about, you know, potentially there being one year where we're not commissioning new stuff instead of putting together a, um, a reserve for maintenance and then whatever the budget is for public art going forward, putting 20 percent each year aside, adding to that reserve for ongoing maintenance yeah. for whatever has been commissioned and will be commissioned. Yeah. And that's part of what's um that's part of why it's important to to understand that the works that are that are adopted into the collection are going to require ongoing maintenance, right? So it's it's important that the that the city have a view, in, in my opinion, it's important that the city have a viewpoint that we're trying to collect pieces that are assets to the community and assets to the city. Not, we want to collect everything we can possibly get our hands on. Because as the pieces age, they're going to need more maintenance and they're going to require a budget to do that. And so not adopting pieces that are going to constantly need repairs is part of the conversation as well. Part of the consideration I think anyway. wildly wise because I think the first opening statement was talking about 300 was it 340? 340. 340. I remember that number and I thought well that's going to be daunting but this <laughs> seems much more manageable and the ability to adopt makes more sense when we're not talking about adding to 340 with adding to a much smaller number. Yeah. Right. So 
things make sense to me. Which is a perfect transition to just, I, just to clarify my own mind, the original pie piece, I don't know if you want to pull it up, but there was like, this, <laughs> I think seven pieces that were in arts and culture to mm -hmm. begin with. So we're talking about adding to that specific. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which we would, yeah. Those seven are pieces that were either donated to the collection or commissioned since 20 or since 2018. Okay. Which is when the public art policy was right. enacted. Got it. So those actually went through an official public art process and are officially part of the public art collection. Okay. Where we want to add certain artworks that meet our criteria so that we can call this the City of Boulder Public Art Collection and we maintain it and promote it and yeah. educate yeah. the community about yeah. public art. Public tours about it. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I would, if, I also would love to hear what Matt was going to say oh, about the library. library. Oh, yeah, the library. That's <laughs> fascinating story. So. Yeah. It's <laughs> all an exclamation point, Matt. <laughs> to every can you step into the camera? Sorry, Matt. The camera will follow. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, okay, there we go. I've trained the camera. That's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> um, so starting in um, the, uh, I believe in the 1990s, there was an addition to the grant program agreements where if a grant was given by the Boulder Arts Commission for a visual arts project, we, that must include the return of a piece of artwork to the library yeah. as part of that agreement. Yeah. And so the library built up a very large two-dimensional collection oh, that was intended for display in the library as sort of a residual to the grant. Um, and in um, as they stopped doing it after a while because it was a terrible idea. <laughs> we removed it from, officially from the grant program in 2013. So that large number is really around the, the residue of that old grant practice. Where, where are they? They're still with the library, library. now mm -hmm. probably the library. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're being well taken care of by the library district. I'm forced to assume. <laughs> <We're still laughs> no, but there, there are important works in there in the library. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that is worth taking care of. So uh, we've been in contact with them since they were in the department. And, yeah. and I'll add to that, you know, I'm still in conversation with the library. And if they have, there's, there's a handful of pieces that Matt and I have looked at that we would say, hey, if the library wants to donate this to the <laughs> city public art collection, we would be open to that to you know accepting those donations displaying them publicly um so that that might happen cool. lauren i think you had a question a couple of just statements first of all thank you both so much for your hard work this is a ton and we all very much appreciate it um staff and um i think the taxpayers too like if we zoom out we want to be sure that the works that we have and see around town are like well taken care of like let's zoom out and make sure that we're taking care of things that have been paid for by tax dollars right yeah. right um the other piece i'm really excited about is the access piece like i really excited to get our signage to look good to connect to have like other languages accessible with it all kinds of other fun things um i wanted to ask about we keep saying adoption and that's adoption by the arts commission right, right? so um do you have a sense of and you don't have to but do you have a sense of when that might be or like what that would look like Hoping before the end of the year, right? Yeah, to come back to you all with like a list of the artworks and images, and maybe we do just pull the vote to accept this chunk of art into the city public art, the official city public art. Can we have an event? We could an adoption party, yeah. <laughs> puppies, oh, and adoption. Art. <laughs> yes, 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 go. yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Um, the last thing is, I just wanted to bring up because um, thank you very much for talking about the one year bridge mm -hmm. short term needs assessment that the consultants did recommend that we continue with this, that we be sure that we have funding and go for maintenance. And that would be from the um, culture arts, arts, culture, heritage tax funding. But we do still have funds for commissioning from the percent for art funds from the CCRS tax, if you all know about those taxes. So there are other funds to where public art will have funding to do other commissions, right? And so this is this would be specifically ma maintaining funds that are from like our office funds. So that's what we're talking about. Right. Very yeah, I, I was gonna add to that I I don't think we'll stop commissioning art okay. art public art just right. if the capital project is moving forward, we gotta kinda <laughs> never stop it. Yeah, yeah, never never clean if we're adopting I just want to make so sure we just we, yeah we yeah, but I think yeah, yeah 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 if we're adopting we'll we'll take care of those ones and then we'll continue commission through an official public art process with the one percent policy. And then once we have the the full inventory, we'll have like a, a score of one to five or A to E just kind of score what condition they're in currently to figure out what what rolling 
Yeah, but yeah, are they perfect? Probably half the collection one year and half the collection the other year. Uh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're you're welcome. Welcome. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah. Yeah. Come back anytime. <laughs> Great. All right, Lauren. Try and follow that up with uh, photos. <laughs> no photos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we have a couple items in the grants program this evening. The arts, the arts education project grants um, commissioners have the option to approve the staff's recommendation for the highest scoring grants, to approve individual grants, or to postpone approval of individual ones, depending on answers to specific questions. I will show here that we have the top scoring are in blue, uh, darker blue. <laughs> With the line and then the um, motion, like the recommended motion language, I pulled out um, Jennifer Social Club Club's recommendation so you can step away, please, whenever you get there. Um, but I will open it back, to, or I'll give it back to the chair in case you want to have any sort of discussion or anything or if you should. Sure. Um, if you, I think what we can do is put the motion language up. Yeah. And uh, if we'd like to make a motion on the first chunk, and then we can have any discussion that's necessary, or if anybody feels like they'd like to pull any of those out for discussion, we can do that at this stage. I'd like to pull out the Dairy Arts Center. Would you like to make a motion for the rest first? Sure. I'll make a motion for the rest of the... Can you, you'd have to read it. Oh, please. I recommend... <laughs> Oh, I move that the Catamounts Colorado Shakespeare Festival, the Cultural Caravan, Boulder International Film Festival, Boulder Philharmonic Orchestra, Open Studios, Boulder Opera, and Luna Culture, Art, Science, and Culture for Thriving Communities be awarded grants in the arts education projects with category. Second. Seconded. Okay. Does anybody have any discussion on those? Okay. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. So we have a motion that carries without any discussion. Is there anything you want to add to I this? Just disagree with pulling the dairy center out. So. Okay. We'll we'll talk about that next. Um okay, so that motion carries, and then we'll have a separate motion for the dairy. Somebody, I move that the Dairy Arts Center be awarded a grant in the Arts Education Project Grants category. Second, great. And in discussion. So, is this best? Yeah, I think like that. So, I just wanted to give Jeffrey the opportunity to recuse your vote. Um, I believe there's a conflict of interest. Um, Jeffrey, when you took on the role for to be on the board at the day as an arts commissioner, you stated that you said, we're all friends, we all know each other, we've worked together before. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been on the board at the very before. Okay. So that would mean that you have a finance, you have vested a financial interest in the dairy. Um, last month, when Jeffrey, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, last Niche. Niche. When Jeffrey Niche came in, and spoke and he the next day sent an email uh to all of us which we have and it's in the packet um jeffrey cash took that email and forwarded it to the dairy um can I interrupt for a moment? I'm just on a point of order in terms of the conflict of interest the actual the actual rules because I know that you have recently spoken to the the legal department about it. So I'd like to if if we have a question about a conflict of interest, mm -hmm. make sure that this discussion is within the scope of what that rule is. Sure. I can speak to that. So um the two points that I mentioned, one is that as a commission arts commission appointee, it's not a conflict of interest because we're asking you to join a board and the same for the two other board appointments that we have, right? 
the other piece is if you're financially fiscally responsible for an organization, like sorry to use this example, but um, as director of an organization, we would ask for two views. That being said, like all of us have connections throughout, so like throughout the arts community. So it's very, I know it's very tough and we're all making decisions about organizations that we have friends with or that we're connected with, but for that reason, the legal interpretation as I understand it is that it's when you have a vested financial interest in the organization. So if you are going to be paid by the funds that the dairy will receive to do this grant specifically, or if you're like working at the dairy, then you should keep yourself. And that's for anybody, right? If you're going to make money somehow from this grant, you should keep yourself, right? Yeah. So within within that context, I just want to make sure that your comments. Are, yes, yeah. I, and I knew that from before because Great. having been on yeah. the board and I asked this question before. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's Jeffrey. Niche. I don't want to Niche. Say, Niche. Sent the email, Jeffrey Cash took it and sent it to the dairy saying, please see attached. There were remarks presented at the beginning of last night's Arts Commission meeting by Jeffrey Nietzsche. Please see his remarks below as well. He was the only member of public in person or online to speak on behalf of the blatant retaliation regarding our important vote. That vote, vote failed the dairy, or the dairy and Creative Nations by one vote. He happens to be my husband as well. There was a second email that was sent saying, Georgia attempted to expunge my husband's remarks from public record, Lauren Click, but the city shut that down. My husband then responded forthwith, enjoy. Um, where it says he happens to be my husband as well, there's a, a smiley face winky emoji. So this again tells me that there's more than just a board relationship that you are friends with the people on the board and the people on the board are financially invested. And when I look at your scores, I don't have them here, but you gave four eights to the dairy and um, high scores in the last two, like there was a five and a four. So, the, so, and I just don't see anywhere else in your scoring where you give that many eights or anyone else. Um, so I just, I think your scores are weighted because of your friendships with the people on the board. Well, within the context of having to prove myself, I, this doesn't fit any of those categories. So I'm not going to use it. So. All right. Any further discussion on that? Not at this time, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Um, any other discussion on the merits of approving this? All right. Uh, so we've had a, a motion. Did we? We did the motion, and we've had a second. And so, all in favor? All opposed? Recusing yourself or? Oh. Um, no. Voting um, opposed. No. All, all, let's do it again. Yeah. All in favor? <laughs> Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Just, not, just a room. Yeah, <laughs> there's a conference room back there. Thank you. Okay. I move that Junkyard Social Club be awarded a grant in the Arts Education Project Grants category. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next, we have two grant reports, um, an Arts Education Project Grant Colorado Shakespeare Festival. So, um, and then the Community Project Organizations Grant from Streetwise Arts. These are the options that you have. Approve all of them, approve individual ones, individual reports while submitting questions. That's we send the funds and then I ask questions after. Uh, postpone approval of individual reports, pending any answers to questions or not, approve them and cancel the final 20%. Okay. 
I move that we approve the grant reports from Colorado Shakespeare Festival and Streetwise Arts. Well second. Any discussion? Other than that, the numbers that they provide are just, it's just, it's wonderful to see the impact. Yep. Uh, I think the Shakespeare Festival is doing uh, really important work. I think this is one of the biggest challenges in our society is mental health for young people. So I think this is a great program. Yeah. I personally continue to be very impressed by Streetwise and their ability to take equity issues from not only the content of what they're working on, but um, through their staff and their organization to the students that they're working with. And I love the work they do. So, okay, all in favor? Thank you. I'll be sure to share your comments in the recording. Great. Thank um, you, everyone. Matters from set. Uh, oh, one more thing. Well, I guess it is matters from set. Okay. It's all of the above. Okay. So instead of trying to email all of you all at once, um, I'm doing something out of out of the box here, but please get out your calendars. So um, I wanted to take like three minutes. And thank you for understanding. A reminder that our final review, not score, of the um, leadership pipeline will be in a couple weeks. Um, Land, Land Acknowledgement Committee, we're still working on that. It will be publicly noticed, I'll let all of you know. But the two things that we wanted to, I wanted to get, have you look at your calendars right now because sending a million emails is- a well, Should that be July? July. Yeah. Oh, July, July. yeah, July. Okay, sorry. But right, yes, and then we decided. Thank you. Um, so we want to do an equity leadership, power dynamics, talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, access, bias, systemic racism, all kinds of stuff with the incredible like engagement team that we have from the city of Boulder. We're building out like a two hour workshop on a Friday. And I really wanted to do this before, as we're in the reviewing the grants program for next year, I think it's gonna be really important that we have this in our minds as we talk about the grant program coming up. Um, so if, I don't know how to do this actually, but we can just briefly talk through what dates people have available out of these three, or if you want to email me with your dates, or if you, I don't know. I didn't think this through. I was just like, I have everybody's <laughs> attention in their calendars. Well, and let's see if there's any any of those that are definitely blackout dates for people. Okay, please and thank you, just so we get this. I think Friday. it's Wednesday, July 10th. God damn it, thank you. So let's first talk about this Friday, August 23rd. 30th? Do yeah. any of those dates work for you? No blackouts. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, it doesn't matter for me, but okay. just to draw attention that Friday, August 30th is the Friday of Labor Day weekend. Day, correct. Oh, so, no, it's not. Just, yeah. Friday, I expect so, you all to be partying. Yeah. Friday, <laughs> United Let's do, United so United I'll look at the 23rd or the 6th. What were you saying about the 6th? is my wedding That's anniversary. United Way Day of Karen. <laughs> we'll have cake. Yeah. <laughs> it's more than that. Does right. any, no, does anybody have? Like yeah. Okay. Would we be able to have a recording for people who are working? Oh yeah, that? yeah. Oh yeah, we'll have to. Okay. I mean, in the best way possible. Yeah. I could do August twenty third, but it would have to be remote. I I mean, preferred in person, but of course, if that's what we have, yeah. I think it's important that we are talking about this and thinking about it while we're reviewing the grant stuff. So, thank you. And then let's so talk the twenty third, the twenty third, yeah. And I'll send this out to everybody tomorrow to get on your very very busy calendars. And then the retreat. So if any of these dates, we usually do a nine to two. We'll have it at another location. We have we serve breakfast and lunch. We do all kinds of different activities and things. It's the best thing that I do all year. <laughs> um, if anybody has thoughts or concerns about this, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll. I'll send it out. Oh, I should get there. <clears throat> Thank you. For anybody Super watching at home, I'm sorry. I'm out of town. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll send you the salt on the retreat, but if you have these, keep them in mind. Let me know. We just want to be sure that we have all of you in person too, if possible, because it is it is really interesting and it's a great 
wait for all of us to get talking about really important topics, right? Actually, most of you are here, but it's great. <laughs> and we do include a, a regular meeting as part of it. Yes. So right. it's part of that. Yes. We fold it into it. And then... Yes, it's instead of the October meeting, which is like the 21st. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Did you, I mean, I can do it too, but did you happen to cross reference this with any Jewish colleagues? Oh, I will. Okay. Or any other holidays. But yeah. Please. Personally, it's a Jewish Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that. I just know they're in October this year. So. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay. Boulder Arts Week update. <gasps> yes. I, I, we have everybody here today. Oh, all. great. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, I finally <laughs> remembered to put my name tag on. Thank you. Okay. So, hi, I'm Cindy Spuka. I am the manager of artists and venues manager for the <laughs> Office of Arts and Culture. Um, and I also uh, manage Boulder Arts Week uh, for the city. So, I just want to give you a quick review and kind of like what we're looking at for the future for Boulder Arts Week, which celebrated its 11th year in 2024. Um, on the next slide, you'll see um, just a brief history. Like I said, I just wanted to kind of give you all a sense for where this started, how it started, how the city has been involved. Um, so you can read through that. It was something that was brought to the city, um, the Office of Arts and Culture from uh, several of our cultural and um, other organizations uh, that approached the city and said, let's do this. Other places do it. We should definitely do it. So Office of Arts and Culture said, heck yeah, we will fund that. And um, the next year, Boulder Arts Week, or as I, I like to call it, BOW, was held. Um, and <laughs> since the beginning, it has been supported and um, funded by the city Office of Arts and Culture. Um, between 2013 and 2018, it was managed by an external consultant. Um, and in 2018, that switched to the city and our own Lauren ran it for a couple of years. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. It's something that the city manages, but it's, it's to kind of celebrate and support all of our arts organizations within the city and, and artists too. So I'm going to go over what uh, happened this year in BOW 2024, um, and basically what it's been, sorry, Fuller Arts Week 2024. <laughs> Uh, Lauren gives Bao a thumbs down. So <laughs> what we did in 2024 was was a continuation of what's been done in the past. So I ran it this year. Um, it was my first year managing it. So we kind of went with what we knew from before. It was basically kind of like a rinse and repeat what, um, what previous um, managers had done with it. So this is just kind of some, some comparison numbers between 2022 and 2024. Um, our number of business champions has gone up, which is really exciting. Business champions are, are just businesses that kind of get involved and we have a reciprocal relationship with them where they promote Boulder Arts Week and we promote their business kind of through social media and by putting posters up and, and giving them love in the limited ways that we can. Um, number of events, and that's, events is kind of a misnomer. Those are number of programs because some of those are, discrete events that, or like a series of events that happen multiple times during the week. So it's not, it, there were actually more actual events um, of those years, but those are like the numbers of programs that happened each year. So it's gone up since it started. Um, number of attendees is back kind of up to pre-pandemic numbers. And this is a total estimate based on the um, data we uh, collect from going out to, um, some of the events because we can't make it to all of them obviously um, we have a slew of volunteers who go out and collect information and then we extrapolate uh, based on the number of events and the types of events and venues and capacity and all that kind of stuff so just so you have kind of like a, an idea of what what happened um here's some feedback we got from our participating artists and organizations um 75 percent of participating artists 
slash organizations believe that Boulder Arts Week helped generate awareness of their events. So either said agree or strongly agree that it helped their events. So that's awesome. Um, nobody strongly disagreed. A couple of people slightly disagreed. And we'll kind of get into a little bit more detail, I think, on the next slide about that, or a couple slides later. <laughs> um, 100% of participating artists agreed or strongly agreed that participating in Boulder Arts Week was a positive experience for them. So even though they may not have thought that we brought them more people, <laughs> they still appreciated the event and um, had a good time participating. And most of them, 93.8% uh, plan on doing Boulder Arts Week again in 2025. So that's exciting. Um, okay. Participating art organizations and artists seem generally pleased with the event. Um, over 70% said that they felt like their participation in Boulder Arts Week helped generate awareness of their event. Um, but we did receive some feedback from more than one participating artist or organization that um, they wish that it was more effective in um, bringing new people to their event. And so um, I got some feedback that some people said the only people that showed up were people that I already knew. And so like, what's the point of even participating, even though it's fun, you guys are great. Um, one artist did write that as an artist who opened their studio during the week, they felt invisible. So that didn't I don't want anybody to feel invisible. Anyway, um, so we're, we're going to be, you know, that's, we're, going forward with those things in mind, um, always want to be improving. Um, so next slide, I believe we start, oh yes, just some quotes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so even though I, there was that 166 number of, of events, um, some of them ended up being canceled. Those were the ones that were, that were planned for the week. So as you all may remember, April 6th had that crazy windstorm and power outages and ever all the craziness. Um, so that was just an issue that couldn't necessarily be helped. I mean, we can try to do as much as we can. Um, but most of the most of the feedback was positive. We did do some more signage this year. We had like yard signs kind of a la open studios mm -hmm. that people were able to put out in front of their events. And I got to roam the streets, posting them in places as well. Um, and that seems to be a good thing. We also got big feather flags that we kind of like brought around to different events during the week. So um, attendee feedback. Um, over half of the people surveyed live in the city of Boulder and all but a few live in Boulder County, um, which is not a bad thing. But if you're trying to reach new people, it's nice to see that we get, it's nice to see more people kind of coming from out of town. Um, and almost half planned on attending only one event during Boulder Arts Week, which kind of, which kind of goes to the, the, the feedback that we heard that people only saw people that they already knew. So the artist or the organization invited them to their events and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to that event. And then when they filled out our survey or our questionnaire that we brought to them, they're like, oh, this is like. Boulder Arts Week, huh? Oh yeah, I guess that's a thing, but I'm only going to this thing. Um, a question. Yeah. Um, do we market it outside of the city of Boulder? We do a bit. It's it's very regional, um, but that's something we're looking into. I mean, like I said, you know, improving each year is is my goal, and so that's something that we're looking into. Um, the possibility of doing that in the future, and that comes soon. Um, but even though people said that they only, a lot of people, um, only attended one event, um, 90, over 90% said they'll come back. And it, the people who said they wouldn't are people that had zip codes that were outside of, mm. um, Boulder or outside of Colorado, actually. And I, I think those people just happened to be in the city. Um, more attendees surveyed than in previous years were unaware that it was Boulder Arts Week. Granted, it was only four. But we did hear that people didn't hear about it. And this, these, these ways that you hear about it, they kind of overlap. So word of mouth could have been from anybody. Email blast could have been the Boulder Arts Week email blast, or it could have been from the organization that put on the event, um, directly from artist participants. Um, some people could have used word of mouth or e-blast or whatever. And social media could be from, from different 
people who are posting about it. So, but that's just good for us for marketing purposes to know where is the most effective way to reach people. I mean, it, word of mouth is the best way, but it takes a lot of time and effort and resources. Um, so, Boulder Arts Week of the future, we're looking at some different options. One is like we did this year, rinse and repeat, continue on the same path, do the, all the same things that we've been doing in the past few years. Um, number two is Goldilocks adjustment, um, a little like incremental um, increase of, of programming slash other good stuff. Um, there has been uh, some talk about adding an awards component to Boulder Arts Week, mm -hmm. and it could be an event or it could just be an awards or, or maybe like it starts out as an award granting of awards <laughs> and then grows to an event in the future. Um, and then also um, adding a year round presence on social media, I think could really improve um, just kind of the reach. So people will be constantly seeing it and, and looking for it. So it's not just something that pops up every once in a while or at, during a certain time of year. Um, along with that includes more, um, more marketing kind of farther afield. And then tsunami transformation is just like crazy, make it <laughs> like do it up. Awards event, like the Oscars, and, uh, <laughs> create some curated program that we help manage, uh, like print out a map, more printed media about all the stuff that's going on, um, more robust pro partnerships with local businesses, sponsorship, et cetera. Um, so obviously each increment or each level above rinse and repeat involves more money um, because things cost money. So um, we're just looking, we're kind of in the budget process now, figuring stuff out for next year. So it kind of depends uh, what we do going forward, kind of depends on funding. Yes. Can you refresh us on what your funding level was for this year? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of weird because there was a, it's about 40,000 a year and it's split between the previous and this year because it Does that in starts in like November the and this whole thing. B2 because that was kind of a weird thing this year because it was an outside consultant for half of the time and then yeah employee yeah so. that I would have to look at yeah so it's kind of yeah it's kind of weird important. yeah it was weird this year it was weird okay yes. but yeah um, around that yeah. yeah and that was that kind of goes into pairs up with the, another curiosity I had which is how much support you had you had and how much staff or volunteer or interns support you would need for each of those mm -hmm. each of those roles. Yeah, I mean I've I've kind of come up with some plans for what we, it would take to do each one, but um it really depends, you know, like we can make all the plans we want, but if we don't have the money for it, yeah. um so they're kind of like the beginnings of a plan and then when we know what our funding will be, then we'll really build that out and make sure that everything's covered, but yeah, um, definitely some more staff or pay, paid person time um, and volunteers. We were a little down on our volunteers this year, numbers of them over last year. So that's something to look into because they're they're the ones that get out and do the questionnaires. So. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have something? No. Okay, sorry. Anyone else? Right on, I hope I didn't talk too fast. Oh, oh thank I you. think <laughs> it's a law. Okay, Bob. Like Yeah, yeah. She's thinking Bob Patrol. I'm thinking Baller. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. I will pronounce it. <laughs> just so fun. thank you thank so you for your really work. good work yeah, yeah totally you got to this time it was fun it was yeah. just getting better every year yeah Even if our really. budget doesn't increase and our weather doesn't well change. well yeah. maybe yeah. 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 can you fix that yeah <laughs> yeah thank you yeah. yeah. what do you practice <laughs> with this week so <laughs> we do have um i i failed to mention a different line in our budget that is eight thousand dollars that's given out in five hundred dollar increments of awards oh right um so 16 awards that are given out first come first serve better sponsorships for organiza organizations and artists to host events during Boulder Arts Week so there's small amounts and they are through our sponsorship program right but it's something that we should consider as part of the Boulder Arts Week budget too because we're being we're able to support people hosting programs like 16 programs during 
Well, that's sweet. I'm very proud of that. Definitely. Yeah, it's a great and little it's super low barrier to entry. Yes, super um, easy, right? The application was super easy, which I think is very it's great. It's good. Um, and then the other piece is just getting back to our Boulder blueprint, our cultural planning process. We did not ask the consultants this now until the for 2025 about what we should do for Boulder Arts Week or any of our bigger, longer plans for Boulder Arts Week, but that will be integrated into our longer term plans because I think with some st like the tsunami, the big funding things that are like on bus ads or like statewide or whatever it is, it, those like big jumps take a lot of time, right? So we wanna be sure that the community is telling us, hey, we think it's a good idea for you to expand Boulder Arts Week pretty substantially before we like are funding it more, but yeah, I mean, and all kinds of resources, not just funding. Right, totally. Human humans. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. Questions about the manager's memo. Any questions? And if not, we will adjourn. Going once. Going twice. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That's not it. We need a new one. It just needs to have a padding on it. Does the, uh, yeah. so it does need to have, have a horn on it. So it's like that. Like a cat. Yeah, like a cat. Like a cartoon one. Okay, you get on that. <laughs>